like you to ask yourself, how has cancer influenced my life? And what I'm hoping to do is to show you how you can take that influence, the influence of cancer, and turn it into something so powerful that maybe you can influence cancer right back. So here I am with my grandfather, 1973, my younger sister is the little one. About five years after this photo was taken, my grandfather was diagnosed with a malignant sarcoma of his right arm. Now at the time, sarcoma was treated with high doses of chemotherapy. And the medicines that prevented the nausea and vomiting from the chemotherapy hadn't even been discovered. So what I remember about this is the many trips to the hospital, the discussions between my parents about whether or not he should continue with his treatment, and whether or not the disease was worse than the treatment. My grandfather died in July of 1980, about a year and a half after he was diagnosed. And the impact of his death on me, my father, and the rest of my family is probably one of the reasons I'm a cancer doctor today. So my father spent the next decade calling cancer doctors witch doctors, and I set off to Duke to prove him wrong. I set off to make things better. So I graduated from Duke with a degree in bioethics in 1989, set off to med school at the Mayo Clinic, and somehow found myself smack dab right back in Durham in the summer of 1994. And throughout my internship and residency, I was fascinated by new cancer therapies. At the time, Duke was the first center in the country to use high doses of chemotherapy for the treatment of breast cancer. And like my grandfather, there was many side effects associated with this treatment. And I was eerily reminded of the treatments that he had endured almost a decade and a half earlier. I'd like to share with you the story of Jennifer. I met her a few years after I graduated from med school and finished my training in early 2004. She was 29. She was working as a cancer researcher in the Research Triangle Park, and she'd been diagnosed with stage two breast cancer. She did everything she was supposed to do, surgery, radiation, rounds of chemotherapy. She worked through all of this, and at the end of it, she set out to start the rest of her life. A year after Jennifer was diagnosed, a brand new way of treating cancer was introduced and approved. This drug was known as Herceptin. And Herceptin's an antibody, that's a protein your body makes normally to, to fight bacteria. And this antibody was against the protein HER2. Now HER2 serves as the motor for certain subsets of breast cancer. So in effect, Herceptin turns off the motor that's driving the cancer cell's growth. The drug was approved in 2005 as significantly reducing a woman's chance of her cancer coming back. It was considered the major medical breakthrough of the 20th century, and many people pointed to this medicine as the magic bullet that German physician Paul Ehrlich had written about over a century earlier. So about a year after Herceptin was approved, I began collaborating with a research scientist at GlaxoSmithKline, Neil Spector. He's now on faculty at the Duke Medical Center. And Duke's location, close to the Research Triangle Park, and the fact that it has a um, world reputation in the field of cancer, fosters all kinds of collaborations. Neil and I's collaboration was a little bit of chance, and but really based on he had good science and we had a problem, which is we wanted to do something better in cancer. He was working at the time on a medicine known as lapatinib. And it also targeted HER2, but it did it in a different way. It was a small molecule inhibitor. So he and I spent the next five years studying this medicine both in the laboratory and in parallel into the clinic. And in 2010, I led a study that combined lapatinib with Herceptin versus Herceptin alone. And this study demonstrated that women lived, on average, over half a year longer if we added the lapatinib to the Herceptin. This combination was approved in early 2013 worldwide and is now the preferred treatment for the women facing HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer. But what was really remarkable about the combination, what made me so proud to be involved in its development, 
is there was no chemotherapy involved. And for the first time in the history of breast cancer, the chemotherapy got thrown in the garbage and women could take one pill and one infusion every three weeks. So let's return to Jennifer. In 2008, four years after her initial diagnosis, she got pregnant with twins. And she did really well until the fifth month. And while visiting friends in Ohio, she actually developed abdominal pain and bone pain. And unfortunately, it was determined that her cancer had come back. It had come back with a vengeance. She went into kidney failure. She slipped into a coma. And unfortunately, she lost her babies. Now, her husband, Mike, was determined to do something. And so he actually had her life flighted back to Duke. She was on life support. She ended up in the MICU at Duke. And although everyone said, you know, it, things look really dire and it's an unlikely treatment will help her, we quickly determined that her cancer was HER2 positive. And we actually started her on Lapatinib and Herceptin. And then, nothing short of a miracle occurred. She actually got better. Her kidneys started working. She got out of her coma. The tumors in her liver actually started to shrink. She got so much better, she got out of the hospital. She went back to work as a cancer researcher. She's made a movie, it's won several awards on cancer research, and her husband Mike's even written a book about the experience. Even today, she remains on the combination of lapatinib and Herceptin. In her own words, my favorite, she calls herself the best cancer warrior she can be. Now, I sometimes wonder, had we had Herceptin just one year earlier, could we have prevented this from happening? And Jennifer's story really reminds me on a day-to-day -day basis, every minute counts in cancer research. Every discovery in the lab, small or big, can make a difference between life and death for patients facing cancer. So after lapatinib, I didn't give up. And I heard about this concept of an antibody drug conjugate. It's shown here in schematic on the video. And it was this idea that you take the chemo, you bind it to this antibody I've told you about, and it drops the chemo exactly where you want it, right on the cancer cell, by binding to whatever it's the antibody is targeting, kind of a smart bomb against cancer. And when I found out in 2009 that people were developing this in combination with Herceptin, I jumped on the chance to study it. This drug was known as TDM1, and Duke was actually one of the first places to get it, right in phase one testing. And what we saw very early on was this. You give the medicine once every three weeks, and people had no side effects. Their hair didn't fall out, there was no nausea and vomiting, and their tumors melted away. And in 2012, in front of 26,000 people, I was able to present the results of my trial that showed that TDM1 was better and improved survival over my old friend Lapatinib. And this drug was approved worldwide throughout 2013, and Duke had the, one of the first patients to receive the medicine outside the setting of a clinical trial. So, I had led the development of the last two medications approved for the treatment of breast cancer. <laughs> it was a lot of hard work and a lot of good luck. But the impact of this hit me last year, and that was when I was named to the Time 100 Most Influential People in the World list. There were some impressive people. The president, the pope, Spielberg, LeBron James. My sons were impressed by that. But about a year ago, in a few blocks, I guess, south of here, there was a gala that celebrated the people that had been named to this list. And one of the last people I met, I think you know him, He's my boyfriend, too. He's Justin Timberlake. And he actually knew who I was. He said, you're the cancer doctor. And this is what he said to me. Cancer affects everyone. We need to do better, and you did something that helped us do better. He took his picture with me on his camera. Now, at that single moment is when I realized, and JT taught me, Everything I hadn't realized to that point. Cancer influences everyone, every day, and we still need to do a lot better. So why was I really on this list? Well, it wasn't really about me. It was about the teams of people that had helped me over the past two decades. My religion professors in undergrad who taught me to ask really amazing questions. The doctors and nurses who taught me throughout my residency and fellowship the patients who still teach me every day to not let their disease define them. 
And it was really the Duke team that was on the list, not because of the influence of cancer, but because the way we had influenced cancer was powerful. Duke cancer researchers, I'd say all medicine, all researchers, have the capacity to change the world every day. I would argue we already have. So I started this evening asking you to think, how has cancer influenced my life? I shared my own story and shared with you how Duke has changed the face of breast cancer. Cancer influenced me very early on. You saw that picture when I was very young. And in turn, Duke allowed me to become influential. Cancer has probably influenced most, if not all of you. And I can't help but think that by supporting Duke, you can be influential too. Thank you very much.